Good morning to welcome you here today. Kind of a back row crowd this day. <laughs> you know, I don't think they have to sit here. That is true. That is true. <laughs> Did he? Oh, yes. Which I do believe he has sung here before. <laughs> no. That is right. That is right. A couple of announcements to go over. First off, this afternoon, Lord willing, or uh, hopefully before this afternoon, uh, we have a meal downstairs, and then we'll have follow that with an afternoon service. Um, I have prepared for us not only this day in history, but as well the next section in our Constitution to go over. We'll have to decide how we want to do that, if we want to do that. Um, my mom is not feeling well today, so they're not here today which means we don't technically have a quorum, but we're technically voting all these changes as one later. So we'll kind of play that by ear. And I suppose we could even broadcast again and get them online as well. But anyway, that, that's the plan for today. It's uh, on a bibli... I just lost it. I wanted to say bibliography. Bibliology. The doctrine of the Bible. I think I just slaughtered that word. That doesn't sound right either. The Doctrine of the Bible. What we believe about the Bible. We'll say it that way. Uh, that'll be the, here this afternoon. And uh, looking forward to that conversation, whether it's today or next Sunday. Um, but beyond that, then October 31st, is that two weeks from today, uh, we have the Halloween event here in town. It will be from 4 to 6. Uh, they're at the courthouse or in front of the courthouse. And uh, they are not enforcing the individual bags, but we may still do that just for convenience. Um, and so we'll have you, if you are interested, kind of help with that in the after the after the meal that day. So that'll be October thirty first, two weeks from now. Then as well, I think we have a good supply of candy. Um, obviously, you can't you can't have too much candy usually, but an amazing supply back there. Um, we will start collecting for military boxes as well, which could include candy. So if you wanted to buy more candy for Halloween, whatever isn't used up, we'll obviously can divvy out between the boxes. Um, but as well, we will we have Bibles already here, and it seems like we'll have a list. We should probably post a list of the things that are commonly appreciated. Now obviously, there are certain things that aren't ideal to mail to ship. Um, but we'll get that list. I think we posted that last year, and we'll post that. And so we'll be collecting those as well. Probably November 21st, which if I am not mistaken, may be the Sunday before Thanksgiving. We would like to, obviously not on Sunday, but probably Monday, we would like to get those shipped off. So we have a good month and a week, perhaps, uh, for collecting of that. And we'll have a table back there as well. So that'll be November 23rd, between now and then, military boxes. And I don't have a number yet. No, I asked him if he thought he could have like around 10, just an estimate. And he, he knew of six for sure, but he has to get addresses. So if anyone else has a connection or someone that is in the military that um, could receive a box, please give an address. Yes. Super. So yes. I got 10 Bibles just figuring, so it's 6 to 10. Yes. To give you an idea when you're, when you're shopping. I know things like uh, beef jerky and. Chapstick, cough drops, nice warm socks if you want, uh, beef jerky, snacks. Yes, that type of thing. Is enjoyed, we'll say it that way. Oreos, Oreos yes. <laughs> but anyway, 
enough of that. I don't know that we have any other announcements. Obviously, in March, uh, Lord willing, we have the corral here. Looking forward to that. Uh, Peter Wright, I think I mentioned last week, did mention that he doesn't expect to have the same, what, 65, 67, whatever they have this semester. He said usually after the first semester, you know, there are some students that aren't able to come back for financial reasons. There's other students that their schedules get too busy, they can't do it. And so he's not expecting to have 65 here. He's expecting it to be more into the 40s, but still that's a lot of, that's a lot of people to be added to our, our group. Uh, so it'll be fun to see how that all plays out, but looking forward to that. Yes? And will they be staying overnight? They will, but not here. Uh, those, they're going to be staying at the camp in uh, Camp Assurance. Okay. So they're here. They'll probably get here sometime around lunchtime. And I think we're responsible for feeding them lunch. And then they'll set up and do a, a concert, and then they're on their way to the Indiana line. And we'll send them some goodies to help with their dinner. Yes. Yes. I believe because they're more of a, a local choir, the camp, the college will send them with sack lunches. And so we will be feeding them here lunch, since they'll actually be here for lunch. And then they'll have their sack lunches for later, but they've asked if we could send some additions to a sack lunch. Since uh, normally that would be lunchtime, and then they get a big meal at night, we're going to be swapping around and and uh, so we'll figure out how we can get all that coordinated and, and uh, orchestrated that way. We'll just have to get them a couple of six foot long sandwiches from uh, Subway or La Gondolas and send it with them. <laughs> yes, cookies, obviously chips, whatever we like to send along. Um, apples, oranges, grapes, broccoli, carrots, and Brussels sprouts. Brussels sprouts. <laughs> Yeah. You know, things that, you know, college students like. What was that? Peanut butter. Oh, yeah, the, yeah, definitely. Get that, send that away. <laughs> send the peanut butter away. <laughs> but anyway, that will be here. It sounds like a long ways away, but I can't believe we're already on the second half of October already. And so it will be coming here shortly. And uh, we'll see how that, that goes from there. Other than that, I don't know that we have anything else. As far as some prayer requests, we have, I think a couple are updated up here. Amy Herbster is the wife of, which Herbster? Mark. Mark Herbster, who's at Maranatha. Uh, she recently had hip surgery and sounds like she's having some difficulties in the whole recovery process. Yes. So be in prayer for Amy. She's, a, I think, one of the campus nurses, if I recall. And then do we have any others that are updated? Obviously, we want to play, pray for the Letts family and the loss there. Yeah, and uh, Nicole posted that Barb should be getting out of the University of Iowa hospital, and they're hoping to transfer her to the Burlington Hospital in their rehab facility. Okay. Yes. But she's doing a lot better. Um, she can, they have her up and walking. Um, they want her to walk with a walker because so, she's a little bit unsteady when she first gets up. Yes. Yes. 
Yes. And that was the, she's having the pet, pet scan. She's having a pet scan. Anybody else? If not, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you again for your goodness. We thank you that you are certainly aware of every need there on the screen, of every need in our hearts. I pray that you would be with these specifically mentioned, that you certainly give a, the health and the strength to Amy uh, there on campus at Maranatha as she's recovering from this hip surgery. And I don't know the details, and I don't know to the extent, um, but certainly uh, we just ask that you give her that health and that strength and you know, just continue her on the road to recovery after the surgery. And we pray that you be honored through that. And uh, for Barb, lots of she's potentially being able to be transferred back to Burlington and the road and the process yet ahead, and it sounds perhaps like a lengthy one. I pray that you give her the grace, the patience uh, that is necessary. I pray that you be with the entire family as well with the loss and, and uh, all the details that are surrounded with that as well. And, and I just ask that you'd, you'd be honored through all of this. Um, I just ask that you would uh, certainly just remind them all of, of your presence, that you'd be with Nicole as well, and, and certainly the, the direct loss in, for her as well. And I, I just pray that you would give the grace where we know is always sufficient, but not always evident, not always seen, not always claimed. I, I pray that they'd be able to see your very presence, your very love surrounding them. Would you pray for Marlene as well with this a PET scan here in a couple of days. I pray that in the entirety of the process and the interpreting of the scan and all those details, I, I pray that you would lead in the decisions and the conversation and the discussion. I pray that as they uh, discuss even the next steps here on Thursday, I believe, that uh, you would give this clarity of mind in, in that entire process and that you'd be honored through it all. And I pray that you'd work as only you can work so that only you are glorified as well. For each one of us, certainly other requests, they're on the screen in our hearts, in our lives. Uh, I just ask that you would guide where we need that direction and provide where we need that provision and that we constantly be reminded of you and your presence and uh, stand in awe of what you are doing. And we thank you for that opportunity that we have to see you at work. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll start with our hymn number four. 415, I believe. Maybe. There we go. 415. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the ever seen arms. What a blessedness, what a peace of mind. Lean on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning the everlasting arms. From day to day, leaning everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Why to dread, what have I to fear, leaning on the everlasting arms? I so near, leaning on the ever, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms, and the last, whoop, that was it, right? I guess I should read the bulletin. <laughs> Uh, continuing on, we would like to uh, take an offering. We'll have Josiah come here in a moment uh, for the offering. Uh, as far as an update, I think most of you already heard this, but we wanted to make sure that everybody already heard this. Uh, last week, our air seemed to have frozen, and a couple weeks prior to that, it had done the same, and 
Uh, we had the technician out here and they determined that it was a little low on, on uh, coolant, the old style coolant, and uh, he refilled it and told us that if there's a leak that it would freeze up again. Well, it froze up again and so we assumed, well, we're going to have to do some air conditioning repairs probably before next summer. Fortunately, we're in October, so I assume we're done with the air conditioner. Um, there's still a possibility that it'll get warm in here, but we should at least be open the windows and uh, at least have some uh, cooling. Um, but nonetheless, uh, we turned on the heat yesterday, and it seems as though the potentially the real issue is that the fan, the blower, is not running. I don't know what the cause is of that, but that would explain why it froze and uh, also why it's not very warm in this building right now. Uh, so I have the, uh, the circuit off for the, the furnace right now, so it won't even try to run at this point. Well, if it does, there's something, <laughs> there's something even more seriously wrong. Um, but nonetheless, uh, we'll have to get that figured out because while we can assume that it won't get hot yet this year, we can be pretty confident it will get cold yet this year. And uh, so we'll see if we can figure that out. It'd be great if it was just a relay switch or, or something along those lines beyond my expertise, uh, but something that will be uh, a quick change. Uh, but the furnace is uh, about 20 years old. I don't know what the normal time frame of a furnace is, but it's, it's, uh, it's lived well. And uh, so we'll see. We'll have it assessed and, and go, f go figure that out from there. Um, but nonetheless, here we sit, and hopefully you will be warm enough. Unfortunately, two things. Unfortunately, there's not very many of us here today, so it's hard to get the body heat. And then as well, uh, Jen came up here quick this morning to check the thermostat to see what was going on, um, because I wasn't even being able to control it from my phone, which now explains kind of what's going on as well. Um, so I had to turn all the lights on, hoping that we, somewhere in this building, we have lights that are not LEDs, because <laughs> not a lot of heat comes from an LED light. And it seems like we may have switched these out. It, it does seem that way. Uh, I know it used to be we could turn on those lights and you could feel the heat from them, and uh, these as well. And uh, I think that we have done a lot of LED upgrades, which means we don't benefit in the heat realm. But we had light, and so that worked out as well. Um, we have the, the lights downstairs as well, but I don't believe those give off any heat as either. But so there is a heater, and. Uh, we may have to cuddle while we are eating. I'll sit together, all spaced uh, together. But anyway, yeah, down hopefully outside. Yes, <laughs> to find the down. <laughs> uh, but anyway, just an update on that regard, and hopefully here potentially this week we can get some more information on uh, what is needed. Uh, I had already contacted Colin to see if he could come over and at least give us an assessment for the air, so we knew how much we would have to be saving up over the winter, but it, it may very well have been a different problem, which may wind up being less expensive unless he says the whole furnace just needs to be replaced, in which case <laughs> it, it won't be more, less expensive. But having said that, we're going to have Josiah come and take the morning offering. And as he comes, let's pray. Do we thank you again for who you are. I thank you how you have always provided in, in miraculous ways, even uh, here as a church, as a ministry. Uh, I pray again that as we give, we give a cheerful hearts unto you. And I, I pray that you would uh, certainly bless the gift and the giver, as well that you would multiply, um, and that we might be able to see uh, a horizon that surrounds us of, of white harvest fields. And I pray that we would take your glorious message to those fields, as you've called us to. In Jesus' name, amen.
pretty good. At this time, we have some special music. Thank you. We want to uh, go back to Deuteronomy here this morning, Deuteronomy chapter 3, in fact, as uh, we continue on following the children of Israel, and more specifically, as the application for us, considering our thinking, uh, how it is that we think. And here this morning, we're going to be looking at the, uh, the thinking of, of the vulnerable thinking, or we could say it this way, the thought process that we have when we believe that we are standing alone, when we believe that we are alone. Uh, the thought process that obviously then removes God from the scenario and leaves us in fear. And certainly the children of Israel had endless opportunities for that, and unfortunately many times they failed in that in their thinking uh, because they forgot that God was indeed with them. I think in these next verses as Moses is meeting with the children of Israel before they cross into the promised land, and kind of replaying some of their history as far as what God wanted them to be reminded of. I think this next passage, as we finish out chapter 3, is a great reminder to us that God is always at work, and we must be able to see him. But before we dive into these verses, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word. I thank you for this opportunity. I pray that you would challenge us, challenge me, I pray again that you allow me to decrease that you and you alone would increase here this morning. Pray that we grasp the truth, that we will live the truth, that, that we would be able to understand your constant work that surrounds us, uh, that we give you glory for it, and that we'd always stand in awe of it. And uh, I pray that you would challenge us now uh, as we look to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Story is told of a, a nurse that was completing her very first full day as a, what do you say, that certified, licensed, whatever the terminology is there, uh, a pinned nurse. <laughs> uh, and uh, she was working in the uh, surgical unit. And uh, on her first day, she happened to get teamed up with the esteemed surgeon, not just of the hospital, but of the region. 
And uh, as they were concluding the surgery, uh, the surgeon made indication that he was going to begin closing up uh, the surgery site and uh, indicated to the nurse that he needed the, the sutures. And she said, wait, we use 12, what do you call those, those little uh, uh, like gauze pads, what are those called? Uh, what was that? Yeah, something like that. Uh, there was a name for it. I, I, I have it even written down, but I was, I was going off my memory here. Nonetheless, she said, hey, we've used sponges. We'll say 12. We used 12 sponges, but there's only 11 here. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, we better grab that next one. And the uh, surgeon says, how dare you question my ability? Do you know who I am? Hand me the suture kit. And she says, no, sir. We used 12 there's 11. And he says, I will take full responsibility of this. Obey orders and hand me the suture kit. And she says, no, sir. We use 12 sponges. There are only 11 here. Please consider the patient. To which the surgeon smiled, looked down on the floor, and lifted up his foot where he had been covering the 12th sponge looked her dead in the eye and said, you are going to make a great nurse. Oh. Could you imagine telling somebody of great superiority over your skills and ability that they had whoops and then standing true to your ground, standing true to what you believe, standing true to the fact that I counted 12, there's only 11 left, or 11 now has been removed you cannot sew this person out. Uh, to be able to have that kind of zeal, to be able to have that kind of uh, uh, stick to itiveness, if we could say it that way, uh, is something to be respected. And as the surgeon did, as he was clearly testing her, uh, he acknowledged the fact that uh, she did well. But I wonder how often we would have that same kind of zeal, that we would have that same kind of courage, that we would have that same kind of this is what is right, and I'm going to stand for it, come what may. I will continue to stand. Obviously, we're told in Jude to uh, be contenders of the faith. And we're also told in Jude that there's going to be those that are going to be coming that are going to do all that they can to distort the truth. Will we truly be a contender? Will we truly be ones that will say, no, this is what is right? Will we truly be those that will say, this is God, and I see his hand, and I will not back down from it. Well, I think there's a number of points here. Um, my wife, who does all the uploading, I do the uploading for the, uh, the, the streaming, and then she has to get from where I uploaded it to the cloud uh, to the iPad. And so this morning after breakfast, she says, oh, I see there's only two points. And I think my face went white, and I said, no, there's... Three, <laughs> and uh, so we had to go back through and figure out where, where what went awry. But anyway, three points here this morning to help us when we feel most vulnerable, to help us to be able to have the courage to continue moving forward when God says, "This is what I have for you," but the world says, "Don't you dare." Uh, do we have the courage? Do we have the mindset, uh, the eyes to be able to see our God, to be able to continue moving forward, knowing that we are not doing this? alone. First, as we begin in verse 21, this is Moses speaking in regards to Joshua, and he says, and I commanded Joshua at that time, saying, thine eyes have seen all that the Lord your God hath done unto these two kings. I'm going to stop right there. I think it is marvelous. This is a great verse, especially that part that I just read to this point, because it reminds us to see God's hand, to see his might. Uh, we kind of overlooked, and I shouldn't say overlooked, we quickly reviewed uh, from their history last week in regards to their battle with Sihon and then the follow-up battle with Og. Uh, they defeat the battle, uh, the king of the Amorites, Sihon, and then uh, they face Og before them. And whatever it was, there's something that caused them greater fear, it seems, than their previous battle. And uh, they were told then, hey, as I did to them, I will do to these people as well. Follow on, <laughs> fight on, and uh, the battle is yours. Uh, last week I mentioned the, the rivers, recall the bodies of water, and as they passed that river Arnon, 
And they are told that once you pass it, the battle is on the other side. They obviously passed it ready for that battle. And they fought those battles, and they won. And here, after they have won, God, uh, we could say Moses, through God's leading, takes Joshua aside and says, you saw what God did. Now, what I think is uh, interesting is those uh, God moments, as we call them, uh, in our lives. Uh, thir- certainly, there are times where, like even in their instance, 38 years prior, they were in a battle as they were being attacked from behind. And recall, as, as Moses stood afar, the sun did not set. Uh, God allowed the sun to continue to shine. Could we not say that was indeed a God moment? Uh, certainly, there are times in our own lives where we say, you know, a, a tumor is there, and they go back, and the tumor is gone. We say, that was a God moment. Uh, we're in the winter, and I hate to think about this already, but we're, as we will soon be in the winter, Lord willing, uh, if he tarries, uh, and uh, the roads may get a little dicey, as they often do in winter times, and we may find ourselves in a slide in our vehicle, heading for other vehicles, and uh, somehow the car finds a patch of cleared off pavement, and the car stops. We can immediately say, that was a God moment. You know, I want to challenge us here this morning, and, and I understand we should not overlook the fact of God's great, mighty works in those quote-unquote God moments, but we also don't want to get so accustomed to the fact that in our search for those God moments that we reduce God to moments. Uh, he is not a God that is uh, uh, just a, a moment God. He is not just a God that is only doing those miracles that we can acknowledge and see him in the moment. But he is a God that is always all-powerful. His hand is always at work. And as, as we consider the, uh, the very reality at the beginning of this chapter where they had great fear, and God says, fear not. I've got this. I've got this. I've got the battle. You know what they still had to do? They still had to fight the battle. They still had to go to war. It would have been great if God said, hey... Yeah, the king, King Og, which is just a great name. King Og is coming before you with his vast army, and it is frightening the daylights out of you. We don't know why, but clearly it was something that they were very concerned about. God says, hey, I've got this one. Just sit over here and watch what I'm going to do. Certainly God could have done that. He could have shut them all with blindness. He could have literally just spoken a word and the entire army could have been killed. He could have, like the Egyptians, caused water just to suddenly appear, and they all drown. Whatever happens, God could have done that. He had the power. But he says, fear not. I've got this battle. But they still had to go to battle. Last week, well, I guess that would be two weeks ago, one weekend ago, last weekend, I had to, for one of my classes, I had to uh, do a final. This was an open book final, but the open book had nothing to do with the textbooks or the class notes. It was an open book test that was basically a research paper. In fact, we had to cite our sources and pretty much have a bibliography to a final exam. It was the worst final exam I've ever taken in my life. I believe that in this open book final exam, I had 28 references cited for a final that had nothing to do with the class notes and nothing to do with the textbooks. It literally was three verses from Jude. And uh, it was, find all the background information that there is about those verses. Okay. <laughs> uh, and uh, we'll be seeing how well you do on that, uh, is what the teacher told us, based on uh, your results. So that was a, a all-week project last week. Basically, it's a research paper. It wound up being a normal research paper. It's supposed to be double space. This one I did single space because it was the final exam. But I think it was four or five pages long, single spaced. Uh, and, and so it felt like a very long final exam with a lot of intense research to, to get this accomplished. And I got that done on Friday, I think last Friday. And uh, then starting this week, I had another uh, big project that was due last night. And uh, so Friday, I never like to do projects on the last day. I, I like to at least be ahead by a day. So uh, every night I came home from work this last week and uh, uh, worked on it. 
And uh, Friday then I came home from work and, and got my messages prepared for today and then spent the rest of the day uh, working on it, convinced that I'm not going to bed until this gets done. And it was about 1 o'clock in the morning. Uh, technically, I guess that is the day it was due, by midnight the, that night. Um, but I wanted to get it done, so I got it done, printed it off. My wife proofread it, found a couple of uh, uh, grammar mistakes. I went back in and corrected those and submitted it and went to bed thinking, oh, project's done. Could you imagine if in that moment I hit submit and uh, I think I gave a really loud sigh and then realized, wait, Josiah's already sound asleep. I probably shouldn't have gone that loud. But it was just one of those, <laughs> I'm done. I am done with that project. Now there's a whole host of projects that ahead of me. Uh, but I'm done with this one. Could you imagine my wife saying to me at that moment, that was a God moment. Wait, I worked on it Sunday, Monday night until from the time I got off work to the time I went to bed, I worked on it. Tuesday night, the same. Wednesday night, I had a meeting, but then when I got home, I worked on it until I went to bed. Thursday night, a, a long time frame of working on it. And now here on Friday, I think I put in, oh, a good maybe nine more hours working on this project. Finally got it done, got it submitted. And uh, I walk upstairs and my wife says, wow, that was a God moment. Now, I would think in our minds we would say, no, those God moments are when you have a tumor and it disappears. Those God moments are when your car is sliding and suddenly you stop. Those God moments are when you have great moments of great fear and suddenly God does something that only God could do and the, the, the situation is resolved. Those we call God moments, but I spent a lot of work on this project and obviously God gave me the ability to read. He gave me the ability to think. He gave me the ability to type. He gave me the ability to comprehend and, and to put it then back into uh, uh, two words. But we don't always see those moments as God moments. But what we need to do is have some Moseses in our lives that will pull a Joshua aside and say, you know that battle that you just fought? That was a God moment. It may very well, now this is reading between the lines because we don't know this for sure, but it may very well be that there's still blood from the battle on Joshua's arms. And Moses pulls him aside and says, did you see that? That was God. May have been that, especially if he was like of my stature and ability. Now, I would doubt that he was, but I think he was younger. Uh, but it may have been that after the battle, Joshua was over there going, Oh, man, I am sore. We have just fought and we've been running and we've been chasing and we've been in hand to hand combat. They, they didn't have battles from a distance, they didn't have drones that did their fighting for them. This was all face to face, arm to arm, uh, person against person. And uh, they finish up the battle, and, and again, I'm just reading between the lines. Joshua's in that moment of, my body aches. That was a fight of all fights. But it is a Moses that takes Joshua aside, as we have here in this verse, and he says, did you see God? Did you see God in that moment? Did you see God in that battle? Because that was God. You know, I think a lot of times we feel pretty vulnerable because we're looking for God's, those God moments. We're looking for those great miracles. We're looking for those times where God says, okay, you step back and just let me take care of this. But there's a lot of God moments, if we could use that phrase, where God says, all right, here's what I have for you. You need to get into this battle. You need to fight. You're going to get exhausted. You're going to get beat up. You're probably going to get some battle scars. You're going to get some wounds. You're going to be sore. You're going to have body aches. But that was me that gave you the victory. And I appreciate the fact of, of the verse being recorded for us as Moses is reminding them. In that moment, I took Joshua aside and said, did you see God? That was God. Do we see God in those moments? Do we see those times when God is doing a work when he's called us to as well do a work? I could ask it this way. What is it often that causes us fear today? And yet we engage in whatever that battle is, even internally at times, and we face those fears face to face. What is it that we fear today that we obey God regardless? 
Do we see God? Can we have somebody on, our, on the side of us tapping us on the shoulder and say, that was God? You had a fear. You faced it. You were victorious in it. You have obeyed God despite, but did you see God? That was God. Uh, I, again, I, I fear at times that we have reduced God to a God of the moment, of the moments, and we've neglected him in the big things. The, the as I'll say, the big things, because they're the things that he is doing, but we overlook, because we're, we're wetting, wiping the sweat off of our foreheads, and we're complaining about the aches and the pains and, and the struggles and literally the battle. And sometimes I think we need a Moses alongside of us. And I can tell you this, there are friends that we have that need us to be a Moses alongside of them to say, hey, that was God. That was God right there. Don't overlook your God. Do we see him fighting for us? Do we see his grace being evidence for us? I don't think I read the rest of this verse. Verse, back to verse 21. And I commanded Joshua at that time, saying, Thine eyes have seen all that the Lord your God had done unto you uh, with these, three, these two kings. So shall the Lord do unto all the kingdoms whither thou possessest. Ye shall not fear them, for the Lord your God, he shall fight for you. Not only that was God, but Moses says to Joshua, that was number one, that was God. But number two, the same God has continued to do what you just saw him do. But we can't neglect the fact that he is saying that to a guy who just finished fighting a battle. Who just fought, finished fighting a battle that they greatly feared, as the beginning of the chapter points out. But that was God, and it is that same God that will continue to do what he just did. Do we see God's hand? Do we see his might? Or have we reduced him, sadly, to just those moments? We ought to be able to rejoice in those moments, those miracles, those Wow, did you see what God just did? That, was, that wasn't me at all. I, I, I had no control over that. My car is sliding, and it, it looked like certain demise, maybe even death on my part. But somehow there was that patch of pavement, and my vehicle stopped, and uh, that was God. But don't forget when we are in the battle, and we're battle-weary, and we're battle-scarred, and we still get the victory, that was God, too. That was God. See God's hand, his might. Secondly, see God's arm. Often the arm is like the, the symbol of, of justice, especially in the uh, Old Testament. See God's arm. See his justice. In the real-time narrative of Numbers, before I read these a uh, couple of verses, in Numbers chapter 27, uh, it mentions the Remember, if you recall, this was a good couple of months ago. Remember when those daughters came up and said, okay, wait a minute. Remember the inheritance conversation? When, when we cross over, our dad is dead and we have no brothers. Well, the first 11 verses are God's response to what about those daughters? What about those sisters? That, that, uh, is there a way that their father's inheritance passes on to them? And, and so there's a response there in the first 11 verses of Numbers chapter 27. But in verse 12... It almost seems to like jump thoughts, but in verse 12 it says this. And God says to Moses, basically go up to the mountains and, and see, and then dine. He says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Get thee up into this mount Abiram, and see the land which I have given unto the children of Israel. And when thou hast seen it, thou shalt be gathered unto thy people, as Aaron thy brother was gathered. In those verses, suddenly we just have the narrative of God telling Moses, Go up, see, and then you will die like your brother Aaron. And it seems to be kind of disconnected. Uh, it, it seems to be kind of like a, oh, yeah, let me throw this in here now. Well, we've discussed the inheritance part of it, but now God has told me this. But look at uh, verse 23 here in this chapter. He says, and I, Moses says, and I besought the Lord at that time, saying, O Lord God, thou hast begun to show thy servant thy greatness and thy mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven or in earth? That can do according to thy works and according to thy might. I pray thee, let me go over and see the good land that is beyond Jordan, that goodly mountain and Lebanon. Now, we could, stop it there, we could say Moses is basically pleading, can I have a second chance? Can I just go? Can I see? Can I 
have an opportunity. I'm, I'm beginning, and I love the verses, the, the, the wording here, where I'm beginning to see your might, is ultimately what Moses is saying. I'm beginning to see this snowball of, of might that is being evidenced to us, uh, a piece by piece by piece by piece. Can I please go into this promised land and see the fulfillment of what you are doing in our lives as a nation? Can I please? Do we see God's arm, God's justice? Here in that first verse, verse 23, when it says, And I besought the Lord in that time. In, in our English, at least in the King James, and it seems like the other verse, do you have something different? Pleaded. pleaded. That's exactly what we think. Besought, pleaded, uh, that ESV. Uh, ESV. Uh, it has that idea of, of, a, of, a, of a begging, of a Lord... Help me out here. Uh, uh, give me, uh, we'll find out in a moment here. Uh, this is National Mulligan Day. It's the day of second chances, so to speak. Moses, ironically, as we look at this, Moses is asking for a mulligan here. Hey, can I have a second chance? <laughs> can I have a uh, opportunity? I know I failed before, and I know that there was this punishment, and I know that an entire generation of people have now died off. But in the real time of this time frame that Moses is reliving, to the children of Israel, he says, back in that day, I begged, I pleaded, I besought the Lord. What is interesting about that word in, in the Hebrew is it is not necessarily a word of, like, it's translated in English. It, it definitely is one of pleading or beseeking or besotting. How do you say that as a participle? Uh, requesting of begging, of pleading. But it is is more specifically a word that has... Great connotation to relationship. It is the same word that is used. Do I have the reference up there? Yes, Genesis chapter 43, verse 29. In Genesis chapter 43, uh, if we could go back many years prior to that, uh, Joseph has been sold into slavery, recall. His brothers come to Egypt because father sent them. And they've come and they've appeared to Joseph, but they don't know it's Joseph. And Joseph says... I will give you what you want, but I need to see your brother Benjamin first. And they question, I don't know, that's gonna, not a good idea. No, I'm standing true. Joseph stands true. So they go back to dad and say, may his life be taken, may his life be ours. If we take him and his life is lost, please take ours as well. And uh, for whatever reason, it's allowed and... Benjamin comes back with them, and, and the verses that, that, that Joseph says, this, I'll read it, it says this, And he, speaking of Joseph, lifted up his eyes, and he saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, Is this your younger brother of whom you speak unto me? Obviously, Joseph knew that was his younger brother, but he's not letting them on that who he is. And he said, listen to these words, God be gracious unto thee my son. That word that we have translated as gracious is the exact same word that we have here in, in Deuteronomy chapter 3. It is, a, is a, a word of great relationship. There's a request aspect of it, but it's a word of great relationship. In other words, I can go to my boss and say, hey, can I have, uh, you know, hey, can I have tomorrow off? That would be the word that I would normally associate with besought. I besought my boss for a day off. If I probably used that word, he'd say, you need more than a day off. <laughs> but this is more of a word, perhaps, of, of, a, of a, well, just like Joseph saying, hey, you don't know who I am, but I know who you are. And may God be gracious to you, ultimately, my brother. Same word is used in Numbers chapter 6, verse 25. The Lord make his face shine upon thee, and again, same word is translated, and be gracious unto thee. Ultimately, what Moses is do is the same word. Lord, may you be gracious unto me. This is not Moses coming before a God that he that had there was no relationship involved. This was a man who had a walk with a God who has come before God. In fact, it may be the only time that we see Moses initiating the conversation with God. 
numerous times, and we've looked at them already, God has come to Moses and said, thou shalt. Even begin from the very beginning, in a burning bush, God initiated, or, or God gets upset, and he says to Moses, I am angry at these people, I'm going to wipe them out. And then Moses obviously intercedes for them, and they have this ongoing conversation uh, throughout these 40 years. But in most cases, if not all cases, from just going from memory, I believe that in nearly all of them, if not all of them, God is the one that has initiated. Here, as we have it recorded as Moses is reliving this before the children of Israel, he says, and I went before a gracious God and requested. Because I was a man who walked with that God. I was a man that was loved by that God, and I was a man that loved that God. And so there's that relationship. But what I find amazing is, as we'll read here in the next verse, God ultimately, we know this, God says, no. No, you're not going into that land. And in fact, stop asking if you can go into that land. But what I find fascinating is that that's in, we're kind of looking at it in three time frames here. We have the real time frame of when it actually happened. Deuteronomy is written years later as he's reliving that history with the children of Israel. And now we are looking at it from way into the future, looking back on both events. But in the, uh, the real time, as Moses is reliving this, knowing that God says no, he still uses a word of relationship. In other words, God saying no didn't change how Moses viewed his God. And I, I, I'm fascinated by that because, again, this is not in real time. This is the, the, in fact, in real time, in Numbers, as I already read, doesn't even mention this conversation. It just says, God says, go to this mountain, see, and then you will die. That's all we have in the real time recording of it. Here in Deuteronomy, as Moses is looking back on that moment, which in this point isn't that far in the, back, in the past, Moses now gives the behind the scenes. I went to God. And he uses the word that he has that idea of a gracious, kind of a familiar uh, a relationship. And he still uses that word, even though he knows that God said no. And he is now giving this speech because he is about to die, unable to go into the promised land. But it hasn't changed the way that God, or Moses, views God. Now, I don't know that any of us really enjoy the chastening of our God. I don't know that any of us get, oh, yay, God's, God's uh, punishing me. I, I don't think that we, we usually have that kind of response. But even in his, his arm, his arm of justice, do we still see our God in that same terminology of a, of, of a gracious God, as a merciful God, as a God who loves us? as a God in whom we love? Do we have that bond of a Joseph to his youngest brother bond, or the oldest, youngest brother bond? Do we have that kind of a, uh, that brotherly connection? Do we have that kind of familiar relationship with our God that God said no? But I'm not going to be that stubborn child that's going to be pouting about this. I'm not going to be that stubborn. Couldn't Moses in this moment have used just the word that in the Hebrew would have just meant I asked God? <laughs> and I asked God, and God said no. But as he is relieve, reliving this and retelling this to the children of Israel, it, I don't believe it's with a mistake that through the Holy Spirit, Moses uses a word that has that concept of a great relationship that didn't change because God said no. And, that, and honestly, that is somewhat humbling, or I could even say it this way, extremely humbling. Because I think a lot of times in our own pride, when our God says no, or really when anybody says no, our pride kicks in and we're like, oh, well, I thought you loved me, God. <laughs> uh, I thought we had this thing going, God. But clearly I can see that I was mistaken in this. Moses doesn't change. I went to my loving God, my gracious God, as one who loves him greatly. And I asked if I could go. And God said no. But as I tell you this, I'm still going to use the word 
even now, after the no, that my God is a loving God. Let me read verse 26. For the Lord was wroth with me for your sakes and would not hear me. And the Lord said unto me, let it suffice thee speak no more unto me of this matter. In other words, stop asking. But that didn't change Moses' outlook. That didn't change that relationship. How often do we look like spoiled children in the view of God's arm of justice? How often do we lose sight of his love because things aren't going the way that we wish they were? And uh, we look at our circumstance and say, well, God must not love me. God doesn't care for me like he cares for them. God's not caring for me like he's caring for them. And we begin to feel vulnerable. We begin to feel, uh, uh, well, we lose sight of his love, his mercy, his goodness towards us. And we may even, maybe without saying the words, begin to question, where's my God? That's not what Moses is doing here. He's using a terminology that means of great love and admiration for the one who said no. Why do we often feel alone? Number one, because our eyes are too blind to see the might of God all around us. We've reduced them to just moments. And in, outside of those moments, we feel alone. We feel vulnerable because where did God go? I, I could use a moment right now, but right now I'm getting dirty. I'm getting sore. I'm getting beat up. I'm getting scarred. I'm in the battle. Where did God go? We feel vulnerable. But it's because our eyes are not seeing God's hand even in the battle. Why do we often feel alone? Number two, there on our screen, because in our pride, we have arched our backs at his chastening, forgetting that he chastens those whom he loves. I don't think I gave any dog stories last week. Let me tell you a dog story this week, our crazy dog. We had, I don't forget what we were eating. I think it was chicken, some kind of chicken. It was a, a, a casserole type of a thing, but it had chicken in it. And you could definitely smell the chicken in it. And uh, our dog is, has got, you know, the curly tail, so it's, it's up but if he, if he gets scared, the tail goes down. And uh, I think all dogs are like, the tail goes down. But because of, of the, the breed that he is, and the crazy thing is a, a full breed, he's got the, the, the very strong curl tail. Well, while we eat, and I'm thankful for this, that he's not as bad as he could be, but his, his begging is this. He'll just sit on the floor quietly, but he'll just stare. And he stares at her. Now, to admit, I'm usually the one that feeds him. I'm usually the one that takes a little piece of chicken off my plate and hair patches. And uh, he loves me for that, clearly. But he doesn't stare at me. He stares at her. And so he'll just be sitting. In fact, literally, as we sit at the table, he'll be sitting like alongside of me, but staring at my wife. And uh, tails up, curled up like it normally is, and, and uh, he's eager in, anticip in anticipation she looks at him, and you'd almost think that this dog at times actually understands the English language. She looks at him and says, you've had enough. That tail goes, he goes, <laughs> We were just laughing. It was, it was oh. <laughs> and then he just laid down on the floor next to me and kind of had that mope. She didn't have to say no or stop. She just said, I think you've had enough. And what she was referencing to is, how much I had already given to him from my plate. And, and, but his response, just seeing that, that curled up tail going, Loop. <laughs> and it was like a slow motion thing going down. We know how often we have our, our tail in slow motion going down as our circumstances doesn't go as we want. And we think, where's my God? I'm feeling vulnerable. I'm feeling alone. Where did he go? I want, I need, and he's not providing. We have like that little dog mentality, and I don't know what kind of mindset he has in that little tiny head of his, but he says, what I need most right now is another piece of chicken. Please, another piece of chicken. And we hear from our God saying, no. Do we still see our God as a loving, gracious God? Moses did. May we learn from that. But lastly, quickly here, we also need to see God's heart, his mercy. We could say his love whatever word you want to use there, but do we see the heart of God? Look at verse 27. Get thee up into the top of Pisgah and lift up thine eyes westward and northward and southward and eastward and behold it with thine eyes for thou shalt not go over this Jordan, but charge Joshua and encourage him. Certainly as from the very first verse we had, Moses was always about the aspect of encouraging Joshua. Hey, that was a God moment. Did you see that? 
but charge Joshua and encourage him and strengthen him, for he shall go over before this people, and he shall cause them to inherit the land which thou shalt see. So he abode in the valley over against Beth Peor. Uh, uh, jumping ahead to Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 5 and 6, it says, So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, over against Beth Peor. But no man knoweth of a sepulcher unto this day. There's great mystery in regards to the death of Moses. In fact, there's even great debate about the burial of Moses. When it says, and he buried him. Uh, unbelievably so, there are a lot of theologians much smarter than I that literally interpret Deuteronomy chapters 34 verses 5 and 6 more specifically verse 6 when it says and he buried him meaning that Moses had an out-of-body experience after his death and literally buried himself I, I don't know if that makes sense to me certainly God is possible to do that but that's what many theologians actually believe when it says and he buried him it could also mean that uh and it seemed to be the the simplest understanding of that verse is that God buried him. Uh, several believe, in fact, Jude, we're going to look at Jude here this afternoon in this day in history, but in Jude verse 9, it mentions that the angels strove with the devil himself over the body of Moses. And so some have interpreted that, that the angels buried Moses. Nonetheless, we know nothing about the burial of Moses. Uh, he went to the top of the mountain and nobody saw him ever again and has no idea where the man was buried. Now, what we do know about Moses later on in time, we know that three disciples would be on the top of a mountain, and suddenly in their uh, uh, exhaustion as they're being woken from a deep sleep, they see Moses and Elijah. Why Moses? We can understand Elijah, I think, perhaps, because Elijah was a man who didn't die. Elijah was the man who was swept away and, and uh, uh, disappeared. He had transferred the mantle to Elijah, and then he was gone. And uh, uh, it kind of makes me want to break into the uh, chariot song, but nonetheless, that, that's literally what happened. And so it, it kind, of, kind of comprehends that, okay, so God brought Elijah back as a representation of the prophets there and, and, and in this case, but why Moses? Moses being probably the representation of the law and the prophets being fulfilled in Christ. And so there's great connection there, but what's up with Moses? Why Moses? Why is his burial so secret? Why wasn't he allowed, even though he had this great relationship with our God, but why did God give him such mercy to be able to send him to the mountain and say, look, and from this mountain you can still see? Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 7, it says this, And Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. Moses, when he went to the top of that mountain, was not going up as an old man. Moses, when he went up to that mountain, still had the vigor and the life still in him. He still had the full eyesight. Uh, we were just mentioning... Well, let me give you some background details. Matt apparently has in acquired a uh, four-wheeler there on camp. I don't know how that all transpired. I don't know the details, but he just sent me a picture and said, look at my new toy. Surely, you know, he makes pennies uh, there at the camp. So I'm guessing one of his friends probably moved on and said, here, I, I'm not taking this with me. Here it is. It's yours. But anyway, he has this picture. So now Josiah is like, Dad, we've got to go to we got to go to camp over Thanksgiving because Matt's got a four-wheeler. And now he's already even dreaming, Matt's going to teach me how to ride that. We're going to go to the soccer field, and Matt's going to teach me how to ride that four-wheeler. And, and uh, all excited about it. Well, anyway, uh, uh, so that continued on to our breakfast time this morning, and he's already again talking about going to, to camp to see Matt. But in my mind, all I can think of when I think of the wilds is following Matt up the mountains and the agony of the very low oxygen levels in my body. Not necessarily where it's so high that the air is low in oxygen, just in this area, the air, the oxygen levels are very low. And the gasping for the very life within me, thinking to myself, I'm not making it up this, while Matt is going up, carrying on a conversation and eating an apple as he does. I'm sitting here thinking, I can't chew, I can't speak, I can't do anything but go... <laughs> And so as Josiah is talking about, oh, Dad, can we go to camp? Can we go see Matt? Can we, can we 
In, in my mind, all I can think about is that I'm not 120 years old. And I could easily, if it were spoken of me right now, it would say, well, I don't have glasses, I don't have contacts. So I guess you could say, at my age, my eyes have not dimmed yet. But this probably could not be said. His natural force has not been abated. Has abated. No, no, my natural force has definitely abated. There was a time when I could have kept up with Matt. Not anymore. Do you see the hand of God, the might of God, the love of God, the compassion of God that gave Moses the ability to have his youthfulness even at 120 years old up to the very moment of his death? Moses had not started slowing down. It wasn't the Moses of, as I mentioned before, Deuteronomy is not an old man kind of rehashing his memories. You know, as we get older, we like to think back on those memories, and we keep saying those memories, and those stories from 30, 40 years ago just keep coming back and back. You know how it goes as we, as we get older. That wasn't Moses. Deuteronomy isn't sitting along the, the bedside of an old man that's about to die. Deuteronomy is a man that had as much life in him as he did 40 years earlier. What mercy by our God that allowed this man to live that way and then took his life and we don't know the details but God said you're going to go up there and you're going to be gathered to your people basically you will die as your brother Aaron Deuteronomy chapter 34 verse 10 says these words there could not be better words that have been written on a tombstone than this and there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Whom the Lord knew face to face. Yes, the man was being punished by not being allowed to cross. But on his death, our God would say there was none like him. That God knew face to face to face. Do you think Moses ever had some vulnerable thinking moments? I think he at times felt pretty much alone when the entire nation is complaining about his God. When the entire nation is saying, we're not going to obey what your God has said. But I doubt that there were very many moments that Moses stood there thinking that God had deserted him. Even in his punishment of not being able to cross God was evidencing his might, his justice, but as well, his mercy. And in his great vitality, yet at 120 years old, Moses is able to climb the mountain, and he didn't need his spectacles to see. He wasn't an old 120-year-old man that said, if only I could see. His eyes could see with perfect clarity what was around him. And he had the means and the ability and the cognitive comprehension to be able to know and see and admire and acknowledge the hand of God. And then it's despite his great agility and ability and vibrancy and energy even, he died. Because it was time for the children of Israel to continue on. But Moses died knowing the mercy of his God. And there was none like him. May we be able to live that kind of way, even in the judgment of our God, even in the chastening of our God. May we be able to see God. Yes, there will be times when our, our adversary is going to try to get us to convince us that we are having a vulnerable moment where God has left us. But may we be able to see our God always and understand his love for us always Understand his mercy for us always. May we be one that is said, whom the Lord knew face to face. Let's pray. Beloved, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for the example of Moses. I pray that you would challenge us, direct our steps, and even in the midst of the trial, in the midst of the battle, in the midst of life, that we wouldn't lose sight of you. For we know that you haven't left, but many times our very eyes grow dim to you around us. I pray like the example of Moses that we would be that friend, that we would be that neighbor to be able to tap someone on the shoulder and say, that was God, did you see it? 
but even in our own lives, that we'd be able to be ones that would be able to see you in our lives, not just in those big moments that we can't help but acknowledge, but even in the midst of the battle, in the midst of the strife, in the midst of the, the sorrow even, to be able to step back in awe and say, that was God. That was you. And we thank you for those opportunities. We thank you for those moments. I pray that we'd be challenged by the example of Moses. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to close one verse of Just As I Am, 562. I guess we can stand as we sing verse number one, 562. As I am without one place, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. May I challenge you, whatever we face this week? Don't forget to see God. See God in those moments. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you again for your goodness, for your mercy, for your justice, for your might. Uh, I pray that we be always in awe of it, that regardless of what we face, regardless of what trials, regardless of what sorrows we even face this week, that we'd still be able to see you and give you glory for it, that our outcome, that our outlook would never change as a result of our circumstances, but that we be, as a Moses, to be able to still declare your goodness, to declare your love, to declare your relationship with us to me, to each one of us. And we thank you for that precious reminder from a man who walked with you. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.